Anyway, hello, Peter. Good to see you. Good to see you too. And um, thanks for, you've been very patient with me about this, but I, uh, um, you know, we've talked for a long time now about messaging. Mm -hmm. And now here I have a real thing that isn't, I wouldn't at all say that it was a typical or perfect case study, but at least it's a, you know, it's a nonfiction book with, you know, all the challenges that, you know, a book faces these days. Yeah, yeah. And it's got some provenance too. So you're not coming in with something that's completely clean sheet. You're building on a legacy going back 35 years. 35 years, which <clears throat> is created um, a, a set of, I mean, which is fa fantastic in many ways. But it's it's interesting because um, it it's made the question of the title more complicated because should it be a new title? I did find out that with Publishers Weekly, they will not look at a second edition if it's not at least 70% different. Um, and I started to think, is this a second edition? First, the first, I think I told you, I, I've republished the first edition, which is selling pretty steadily and and it mentioned frequently. And it's quite different from, you know, why would I just kind of repeat that when there's actually new stuff. So I'm thinking of this more as a sequel. That's a good way to think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is, you know, which changes what I, it changes the job I have to do, but I think it will make, it will be, it's more accurate and it will make the book more, um, much more useful and able me to put the, you know, because 35 years. <laughs> It's a long time. And, and the whole premise of the third place has become much more widely communicated. I don't know if it's really reached the level of being a term of art in everyday conversation, but, you know, certainly the CEO of Starbucks has made it his cause. And that's kind of the underpinning of his vision for that huge organization of, I don't know how many stores at this yeah. point. Yeah. Yes, so so it's it's used it's used widely, um, mm -hmm. inaccurately, <laughs> sure. for the most most part, as I have found. You know, people will apply it to all just all kinds of different things, um, but it always pop always positive. That's I mean that's one advantage. It might yeah. not be accurate, but it's not as though it's being applied to you know gangs or something you know that yeah although in theory one could i mean gangs i'm sure have their third places yeah i guess <laughs> it comes but, but, up but it, but it certainly has been more objectively recognized and certainly monetized. I mean, we work yes. at another example. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have a list of dozens of major corporations mm -hmm. that have tried to leverage that core premise of the third place into uh, a new type of organization that creates even better places for people to congregate. And Yeah. And since it. the pandemic, yeah. there's been lots of different things, uh, you know, different kinds of um businesses you know mem membership spaces of different kinds some more recreational some you know mm -hmm. the co-working spaces um then you know the, all the debate about um about whether online should be the is the real you know the fourth space or if we should read you know the, so there's lots of discussion and debate which is great um in terms of a, a book because I, i'm obviously picking up on from the the person who originated the idea and defined it in a way that is still re recognized and repeated everywhere I, I have google alerts and the nice thing is and i don't know how this he was so um successful at this but almost every article that is talking about third places and finding a third place, it will ref refer to Ray Oldenburg and often the title of the book, hmm. which is like a publisher and author's dream, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
to get that reference there. So obviously, and that's where why I've been interviewed already and asked to speak is because people go looking for him and they end up with me. They end up, you know, they see that I'm the working with it. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. so it's, but, you know, I got in touch with you last week because I was thinking I have to have a subtitle. Yeah. And, and subtitles, we've talked about this, you know, you've talked, you know, it, why don't you just kind of give a little, you know, your, your thoughts about, cause I, I, I was going sure. through your notes about word, the idea of word play and, yeah. and attracting uh, readers. Yeah. So, I mean, particularly in nonfiction, just to kind of get specific because of what we're working on right now, um, what I've found is that you may have a primary title that is memorable, but not fully um, getting a browsing book reader or book buyer to a point of action. So the goal in anything we do in communicating books is to create action. We're looking for somebody to click. We're looking for somebody to pick up a book. We're looking for somebody to turn a page or read a review. So um, more often than not, that primary title is the the mnemonic. It's the something that you remember after you've had maybe that first encounter with the idea of the book, whether it's listening to an interview on the radio or whether it's in a casual conversation with a friend. It's like it's the link that takes you from that initial uh, encounter to hopefully further activity, action, investigation, and hopefully a purchase. Um, but Again, that initial primary title doesn't necessarily make you act. It just gives you the tool to remember to pursue something that might have intrigued you. The subtitle is the engine, to me, of the book's message. Uh -huh. it's the uh -huh. pulsive force that makes you go, hmm, what is this? This is something I have intrigue for it's something that has some kind of revel relevance to me and my interests um and it's maybe asking a question that i don't know the answer to or it's exposing me to something that i wish i even knew existed before or um any of those kinds of sort of motivating uh principles mm -hmm. um that get your brain to light up a bit and um engage and, and do something mm -hmm. so the fact that you're now looking at the subtitle is 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 really um terrific and a testament to the fact that you're understanding what you need to do in bringing out this sequel and i love the fact that you're framing it as a sequel it's not a, a second edition is mm, yeah okay that's a uh uh, a textbook publisher just looking to uh, revise the uh, the offering and make sure that uh, all those used books that are being recycled don't get uh, recycled. <laughs> right. Time, right? <laughs> or as the sequel is, you know, that's a whole new generational step in the process of what this principle is all about. So I, I think that's very, very exciting. So, you know, that's not quite a subtitle, but it certainly frames it in a much more interesting way, I think. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, it's funny but, how it, it how long it takes to for things like that to sort of fall into place. Yeah, yeah. And you go, oh, so, of course. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's see, uh, I just had a thought, but uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, in terms of you know explaining it to people, because that's what's really on my mind now is, it, as I think about, especially when I came back to all my notes with you about testing things, I thought, okay. How do I explain this book? What? How does the title tell people? What does the title tell people? What does the subtitle tell people? And then what am I just saying about it? So that's when I finally went, ah, a sequel. That that's so much more accurate and and appealing. And then I guess just building off of that, just kind of off the top of mm -hmm. my head, the fact that you have a thirty-five year hiatus gives it a lot more significance too. So in this case, we've seen, you know, the revolutions around this concept. Yeah. Everybody's been exposed to in, in, in very, very major ways. 
So um, that makes the sequel even more significant in that respect. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, subtitle super important engine of the uh, engine of the message. Um, the first question that I will always mm -hmm. ask is who's the target audience or what possible target audiences do you have? Because any message is there to connect with a certain thinking style, certain segment of consumer, certain type of book buyer, whatever it is. We're not doing mass media here. We're doing narrow casting. We're doing something that's got a very particular place in certain worlds. And we want to make sure we get to the best place of those worlds that will connect with that audience or those audiences. So I guess that's the first thing we need to figure out is who- I knew you were going to ask this. Good. Okay. So that is what <laughs> I worked on this morning, in fact. Um, <clears throat> and I found a, a useful example from someone else writing on a related topic. So uh, the, the people I have in mind, I, I thought when I, the, the most interesting things I have found on third places in the last year have been discussions on Reddit, which is a forum um, kind of anonymous for mostly men, mostly younger, mostly kind of tech and online oriented. So, you know, definitely not my normal crowd. Yeah. They, they get the concept of third place better than anyone else. I've been talking to a lot of people. They get it. They long for it. They want third places. And the discussions have been intelligent, you know, with people explaining the concept, saying what the problems are from all over the world. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I, rather than jump in, I feel like the book is my way of providing them with some other ideas and mm -hmm. and and all so it's a an audience i didn't i wasn't expecting but um, outside of using that channel yeah do we know what their i don't reasons I, for I, needing to unpack third place are? they're all talking about they need they, they're missing friends and social life. They don't have, they don't have ways to connect with people. They're un, they're dissatisfied in some way with their life, and they know it. They, if they're sitting there on Reddit communicating with people, but they say, "I'd really rather be somewhere else talking to people face to face." Interesting. Which but they're not coming at it from a business perspective or from an academic no, perspective. No, very personal. From a sociological perspective. It's just, hey, I got a problem. And very, I just, very I personal. And I think that the majority of the readers of the book have come to it from, and the person who gave it to me was a man, a middle aged man who was my editor. And he said, he gave it to me. He thought I'd be interested, but he also said, boy, this really speaks to me. And and that was, you know, many years ago and led to my first correspondence with Ray. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a, a, a it does seem to skew male. Uh, uh, interestingly, that that has been pretty consistent um, that they respond to the idea, they get it, they the the I the belonging is there. So that's an interesting one dynamic for, for me. Certainly that's not true yeah. when I've written about ecological, you know, eco living and stuff. That's been much more female. Um now that typically a book like this would be aimed at sociologists, at policymakers, town planners. And real estate people are big, although I'm not sure they're going to buy the book, but they talk a lot. They'll ask me to speak ab about the ideas I did last week. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was looking at a book about um, by an architect or an architecture professor um, who was writing about places, a different place making in a different way. But she said she she said she she wasn't being read by the architects who she she was teaching budding architects, but. It, she thought the architectural community would be interested in her book, but she said it was much more um, um, policymaker types um, and and educators. 
Now, I don't know that that's true. She was writing specifically about designing places that felt good, thinking about the kind of emotional um, qualities of d design. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which is so, not the same thing, but it's related. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's I mean, you, you basically have kind of like two major, as <clears throat> ideally you often do, Two major sort of audience world so you've got what i would say is almost like a crossover audience of people from a wide variety of um, backgrounds who have a emotional need a longing as you put it that needs to be solved and then you have people who are much more in the applied world of business or academia or sociology or public policy right i mean certainly the uk they're identifying loneliness as an epidemic, as a tangible problem. And so right. Well, and our surgeon policy. Yes, and our Surgeon General has come out and said it's a major health, you know, a health issue. So anyone who's involved in healthcare in terms of like well-being and dealing with loneliness, this definitely comes it is one of the is a topic that that they ought to pay attention to and that I think will they will um, you know be interested in or are interested in, but they need a new take on it. The original book I think doesn't quite you know get at what some of the the issues now. That's you know my opportunity. Was it originally published by University Press or what was it? Was it a no a small? Was it? it was published by a small press. I think it it. What, the original one was called Paragon and then Marlowe. You know, it was a small New York press. And Ray, Ray Oldenburg was a sociologist mm -hmm. who had published one article on the subject and then decided he wanted to write a book that would be more for a uh, general reader. And he worked, he did eight drafts. He really worked at this, trying to comb out all the sociological jargon, which he did very successfully. Mm -hmm. The thing that made it such really kicked it off is the that it was reviewed in the New York Times um, book review, like big piece, super favorable editor's choice. It was, but that was a surprise. It was a surprise. Ray didn't know. I don't know how because he was. I'm not sure he was getting the New York Times, but it that really, um, it really um, kicked it into a a, a new place and is why it came to the attention, I imagine, of, of Howard Schultz. So Ray's, into, although he was an academic and his first, the first article on the subject was more academic, this book was not, very deliberately not an academic book. Okay. So yeah. that's already been yeah. designed into how the book was created. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's extremely helpful. Um, I mean, you, you could you could almost posit two editions. One is for practitioners and one is for the general audience. But I'd rather go for the general audience if you can, which is always the most difficult to achieve, but has the greatest result if you are lucky enough to get it right. And it will then work for, it's like, um, I don't know what you'd call it, but the, what works for a general audience, I think, will be successful. I mean, will still be applicable to the policymaker. Yeah. I mean, I could certainly later publish something that's more academic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But or or more more of a how-to because that's something that Ray didn't really tackle at all, and I'm looking at right, more said, of the yeah. very <laughs> specific things. Um, I, I loved finding that he had made a list of possible subtitles. I guess the title seemed to have become clear because it's got, it alludes to Henry James. It's got a kind of literary, some uh, literary um, um, provenance. And I, but I did think because third place is, is um, a term that is familiar. I ha did toy with the idea of getting that those two words into the title or something yeah let, let, let's talk about that for a minute because mm -hmm. um in a third print place is maybe brand is the incorrect term for it but it is a very i believe widely recognized term that has real meaning for a lot of people 
it has equity, it has value. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that people will respond to because it connects with something that they're interested in. And so to not include that um, would be a huge missed opportunity because, you know, if you take where I think you are currently, you know, the, the great good place, you know, that obviously has multiple interpretations. Are we talking about heaven? You know, what, 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 what <laughs> yep. is that? Yep. You know, it's not something that's going to be necessarily immediately familiar because it's a 35 year old book. Mm -hmm. The greatest asset you are working with is that term third place. Uh, so you need to get that in there in a way that isn't, oh yeah, I know what that is. Move on. You need to get that posited in a way that makes people go, oh, this is a sequel, this is a how-to, this is going to solve a problem for me, this is going to give me something I can use, um, whatever it happens to be. So I think that's really important to put that central to what you're doing, okay. whether it's in the headline or, in, I mean, in the title or the sub, sub subtitle. Um, I just haven't yeah. fig figured out how to do it. I just can't figure out how to do it so that's really what we're talking about is trying you know how to how to play with the words uh, because I can't if if I call it the great good place uh -huh. I can't really have third place in the subtitle I mean it's going to sound weird every time I've tried that that's why I'm saying at the moment yeah I mean you've that, got yeah you got place in there twice um but then since we're calling it a sequel, I mean, you're almost thinking about movie titling here, The Great Good mm -hmm. Place, the sequel, how the third place has become a solution to, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. or um, how to use the third place in your own life, or how to, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the, mm -hmm. the how-to is, but linking those together where mm -hmm. you have that connection of the term that everybody knows now being applied to solve a problem for you in, in whatever way that might be it's, and you know going back to your target audience mm -hmm. you're saying these are people who have a longing for more society and more connection um but again from a subtitle standpoint you don't want it to say you know this is the library description of what the book is it's the log line description of what the book is in other words it's the thing that makes you go okay tell me more mm -hmm. so you don't want to give the uh the punchline away in the subtitle you want to set up the joke mm -hmm. well this is the this is the thing that i have learned from you or i'm trying to to learn is this is is this flexibility about these um, words because you're trying to figure out what actually works in the real world and that's what people writers in general um we, we come up with something and then we cling to it we think we we know or an editor we know a publisher we know what will work we know what the best title is so I, I you know I, you've heard me use this term i think before baby naming you know it's my child <laughs> i will call it as i best see fit how dare you <laughs> tell me otherwise my child yeah and so. and that's what i'm working very hard to to be um you know rational and objective and distant about this that i'm thinking of this and that that's where i'm you know and that's why just uh, that's why i wanted to record this because i think it's a useful thing for a lot of people who get wedded you know it's so easy for us when we're creating a book or i'm sure for an editor editing a book we get wedded to our own idea and boy you like have to hit someone with a hammer to say no maybe that's not the best thing um, and then how do you figure out the best thing? You know, how, I mean, it, Ray was obviously thinking about it because I found in his old files that he gave me, you mm -hmm. know, a long list of possible subtitles yeah. where yeah. he'd just yeah. been brainstorming them. And the subtitles of the previous printings, I won't call them editions exactly because they're pretty much the same book, but just different publishers because one of these little presses were sold on and sold on. <clears throat> um they were always lists 
of types of third place. Yeah. You know, Which bars to have very accessible. Yeah. Right. So very, you know, very beauty um, parlors. Yeah. Right. And you know, it varied. I know I noticed that they put book bookshops into book or bookstores into huh. one. And I don't know, because they obviously wanted to appeal to bookstores. <laughs> You know, yeah, or, valid comment too. Right? Or or libraries. So there was obviously a little marketing. They said, you know, let's let's be be friendly to the people who are going to support us and support this book. But um, I think it's important to distinguish between you know these two elements of the book. I mean, you know, the the book itself, the manuscript that you've labored years on, and what do you say, eight eight different. Uh, versions of it before it was actually <laughs> published um the goal i think for an author should be to get as many people to read that incredible labor as possible yeah the purpose of the title is not to be the baby naming experience uh but to be the vehicle that propels people to read the book yeah. so forget the pride forget the uh, parental, uh, you know, drive to to name your your creation and think about it in a different way. This is here to get more readers for my work, and whatever will do that the best is the right answer, not whether yeah. I have uh, a title that I thought of in the shower that I love the sound. And, and that that's a tough one for authors and editors. I mean, have you found that? Do you find it? It's it's deep, deeply seated in the tradition of, mm -hmm. of, of writing, right? Mm -hmm. It's the, you know, it's the cherry on top of the Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I would say having work in Big Five Publishing, uh, the book's design is, is very much that for the publishing team. Mm -hmm. They may not be titling the book. Oftentimes they are. But whether they are or not, the graphic presentation of the book is this coveted uh, activity uh, that is fun. You know, you get the whole team. Uh, right, right. Our character comes sure. in with, you know, 20 versions. And then you talk about, you know, the font and the color and the aesthetics and, you know, completely irrelevant to whether the cover is going to do its job of getting people to buy the book right it's just it's fun to indulge in your own personal tastes yeah and um that's not what you're being paid to do but that's been the tradition of the industry for you know 100 years or more where you know graphical covers have been part of the process a kind of a, a it's an art art project rather and than, it's also yeah. closely held it's it's very rare for a publisher to give uh the author a whole lot of input on that what they'll do is say well here are two and we've chosen this one don't you love it yeah <laughs> and a right. discussion oh but but you know no it's it's our oh yeah it's in the contract i put it in my contract yeah. actually with people i get to design yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so, but, but, but but that's not really the purpose the purpose is right to now if if treat. i think with with this book i have um, you know, the general audience, the 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 longing for audience, and then I've got the pro professional policymakers and stuff. Now they will be a, an easier sell. They are a more straightforward. Yeah. So, so I seems to me I should focus on that general audience, you know. I mean, you'd almost want to test it both ways. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the hardest reach is the broader, broadest reach. You know, the crossover yeah, title right. is, you know, the Grand Slam home run. And they're hard as heck to get. Yeah. When they work, it's right. magic. When they don't work, which is the majority of the time, it's right. a disappointment. Um, so I think you want to kind of cover both sides. And as you say, with the more applied approach on the uh, academic or practitioner mm -hmm. side, um, you've already got a leg up, right? Because yeah. they understand yeah. this is a sequel to a very important yeah. book. Um, <clears throat> but the the big reach is to find the right language that will motivate a, a, a general audience. And then if it's younger males, um, 
how do you do that in a way that makes them go, mm, if I read this, I'm going to come out with a new way of thinking about what I do or what I can mm -hmm. do for myself. Yeah. And that's uh, uh, it's a big promise of a personal transformation, maybe. Um, but how do you do make that in a way that's tangible and um, motivating? So and how do I get the feedback? Uh, I um, Well, you I want to go through, yeah. you know, what specifically uh, is the way that this book will satisfy their craving or their need? Uh, and there'll be multiple ways that it might do that. Some more credible, some less credible, some more effective, some less effective. Um, I mean, you talked about the previous subtitles, cafes, coffee mm -hmm. shops, beauty parlors, general stores, bars, et cetera. That's super tangible. You know, yeah, I go to a bar and yeah, you're right. I go to the bar, not just for the drinking, but for the, uh, the friends that I uh, want to catch up on, on major league baseball or whatever it happens mm -hmm. to be. Um, so that immediately makes it something you can relate to. But then the question is, well, I'm already going to the bar. What's this book going to do for me? So how do you take something that they already have a bit of a sense of now that you've explained mm -hmm. it and put it into something they can do to help themselves? Right. Because what they'll say is, you know, not every bar or coffee shop or whatever they say well, it doesn't it doesn't give me the feeling that I'm hoping for that That's sense true. of connection, yeah. you know, that that the the happy lift of it of you know lift it doesn't lift my spirits the way I know when I see it right yeah, yeah and obviously right. uh, right. Howard Schultz has done a pretty good job with his fifteen thousand or however many Starbucks there are globally I know there's a new one coming up in Bennington Vermont it's about to launch probably next week um, they just keep expanding. Um, so he obviously had some way, intuitive way into doing it that way. Um, but how do you use this as a tool to help people do what you just mentioned? Yeah. Find the good bars, find the good bookstores, the good right. beauty parlors, the good barber shops. So, um, so um, you know, I what I wonder is how how I to would I give a list uh, you know I guess in a focus group you would I don't know show cards or you might flash something oh yeah as far as thinking, evaluating yeah, it yeah, yeah. you want to basically I mean the, the simplest way to do it without you know using a full quantitative process that that we do is to put them on cards title subtitle and then have you know maybe four or five, I would say no more than six ready to go. And then to go find those audiences that go to a Starbucks, uh, go to a bar, <laughs> go to a, a beauty parlor and just say, hey, I'm working on a book. And does anybody here want to help me with uh, how I talk about my book? Most people will say, yeah, sure, why not? And then just flip through cards. And, and the question is not do you like it, but... If you saw this on the internet, saw it on a poster, would you act? Would you click? Would you browse? Mm -hmm. All you're asking for is, will this make you act in a way that's beginning the engagement process? And, and how would you separate the 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 title from the subtitle from the cover? Because if you're, we're just talking about those components, right? Not. I mean, you know, it's a bit of a, a leap of judgment there to do it in uh, a short enough number of options that you're not going to just completely fatigue and, and yeah, or yeah. annoy your sheer right. subjects. Right. Right. So I think you're going to have to think about what pairings. I mean, if The Great Good Place mm -hmm. is incontrovertibly mm -hmm. the title, um, the sequel, um, then it's really just that's a, that's the control and mm -hmm. you're going to just be rotating through different uh, yeah you might throw in try some different ones try try one or two that are different just to see if some if that made people light up in some different way yeah, yeah. or go <laughs> you know i mean it would um 
you know, is the great good place. I mean, that gives you permission to say the sequel. People, yeah. well, I don't know what the the first one was, so it's not really helping me. Right. Um, it's not Star Wars. Yeah. And then you also have another sort of suggestion of the sequel, you know, 35 years after the fact, you're mentioning the 35 year mm -hmm. time, time difference there mm -hmm. that says sequel without saying sequel. Mm -hmm. but that posits that you already know what the great good place was 35 years ago, which right. you won't if you're just a general right. audience. Right. So maybe the great good place is more the um, practitioner's title. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go to a sociology conference and start flipping through choices there. And then maybe you have a different one for your general audience that gets to the longing issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so then you would really want a new unique title. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know that third place would be the lead title because, well, yeah, I've already heard of that. There's nothing unique about that. But you definitely need third place in the subtitle somehow. Mm -hmm. So people, both, so it's very, audience. so it's just clear that that's what the book is. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's the that's the that's the benchmark that everybody's kind of connecting with, right? Yeah, you know what that is. Yeah, it, what it, what it, what exactly is it? What is it? Why does it matter? What's it going to do for me? Um, yeah. how, how does it work now? You know what what. What does it mean after the pandemic is one of the questions. Yeah, I mean, that was, you know, that's the, the anti third place, wasn't right, it? Right, right. But um, there's a term called court of familiarity. So if anybody's going to ever be interested in anything, it has to be relevant to something that they care about and is somehow familiar to them. It can't be mm -hmm. something so completely new and so completely disconnected from their reality that I don't even know what you're talking about. This is like, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. there has mm -hmm. to be some point of connection there that's familiar to your audience that they are. OK, I have a vague idea of what we're talking about here, but uh -huh. what's better, different, newer, more unique, more meaningful to me than whatever this thing yeah. that I'm familiar with is. Right. So something right. completely like unknown is is, is not going to be. Yeah. Effective yeah, so I want I want that it want it needs to be something that they kind of recognize, but are also still curious about, and and that I'm telling them they're gonna know more. <laughs> they're no, can, gonna they know more. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're yeah. gonna solve parts of yeah. it that are yeah. not familiar to that them. That are not familiar, not clear. Um, so, for example, um, when we worked on Daniel Pink's book on um, perfect timing. Uh, and believe me, there were many, many iterations on what we call perfect timing in, in, the, in the titling. Uh, but ultimately, that was the one that was the most resonant to people because everybody knows what perfect timing is. It's like, well, you know, I'd never get right. perfect timing. It's it's elusive to me. It's something yeah. that I, um, I've always wanted. So it was, you know, the, the scientific secrets of, of perfect timing. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'd like to be in on that. Yeah. Uh, and that was in a highly successful uh, subtitle. The primary uh -huh. title was, was I think it was Time, which is, ooh, that was a preempt from the publisher at Crown saying, now we're uh -huh. going to make it Time, which is like, well, that's really memorable. <laughs> <laughs> take a word out of the dictionary. <laughs> and, uh, that's, that reminds me of one of the ultimate sort of bet noirs of, of titling is the one word title. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. It's not a title, it's a word. Right. And and you, you unless could... you create your own word, um <laughs> like Moneyball. Right. Uh, you're right. not doing you Google it. That's right. the, 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 right. the acid test of any title is to Google it and see how many other people have used that word to their own purposes. And uh you will be instantly appalled that that is not a very unique way to describe <laughs> your your cherished work. So time is probably. <laughs> I mean, just to, just to wrap up, then um, first is to re re recognize and, and constantly sort of reaffirm that the reason that you are creating a title and a subtitle for a book is to get people to be curious enough to engage with the book and want to read it and hopefully buy it. 
So if you're titling without that as your main goal, enjoy yourself. It's not going to help you get readers. Um, and uh, to me, it's more important to have people read this incredible work than to say, I titled this document. One of the, the things that you told me one of the first times we spoke, which I thought was <laughs> super interesting, is that you don't only want people to know about the book. You want them to be willing to click, to look at, look at it, and then to think about it enough to click, you know, to do the next step. Yeah. And and it's really, it changed my way of thinking about it. I realized that there is a sequence of steps and this this thing, and you've, it's, it's kind of like writing about the great good place, thinking about how people feel. You know, what you really are talking about is what emotions or, or thoughts or reactions are being elicited by whatever they're seeing. Yeah. Um, I mean, simply put, does it make the person you want to act, act when they see it? Yeah. And yes, yeah. you can get into all the different flavors of action and motivation, but, you know, is there a, I'm going to, I'm going to click. Right. That's, that's really all you're trying to solve for. Will you click? Right. Uh, and um, if the answer is yes, that's a great start. Does that mean they'll go all the way through all the things you talked about ultimately to want to read and hopefully buy or not? There are many, many pitfalls along that road, but it all starts with the first click. Yeah. Without the first click, it's just one of a thousand books that's gone by your eyes that week that you have not noticed and will not engage in. Right. So that's that's the that's the key of what we're trying to do. And so when you evaluate it, when you test it, when you show it to people. All you want to know is, would you, will you act? And so, not, do you like it? And that is mm -hmm. where 99.9% .9 of these discussions take place in major publishing houses is, do you like the title? I don't care. If you like the title, you're not the audience. <laughs> and liking is not acting. Yeah. And it won't well, sell more books. All right. Well, I have some homework to do now. So there's that, then there's the audience. So I think what we've talked about is you've got this potentially very large general audience of people, potentially more men, potentially younger, who have a need, a longing that a third place can hopefully address in some form we haven't really discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, and that could be a very large crossover title that could appeal to a wide range of different types of readers. Or you have a practitioner's edition that's very specific to people who are very deeply engaged in the application of third place to their business, to their, their teaching, to their public policy discussions. Uh, and so each one of those would have a discrete type of messaging and hopefully give them what they need to solve their own personal uh, challenges. Um, the primary title, in my view, is the thing that you remember that is unique when you Google search it, that like Moneyball kind of is a bit of an mm. earworm that yep. you lock into. And and, and, and the it's home run example. on this one is, is yeah. to create a new term in the English language that then becomes the defining statement. I mean, third place is in a sense like that. So you, you already are working with one of those. Uh, but in a sequel, maybe yes. It's, it's it's so interesting to have this conversation as I'm finishing, you know, in in sort of finalish stages with the manuscript because this really also makes me think about what I'm doing in the book. Um, yeah, that very and, much yeah. informs the book too. Yeah, very. It's it's it for for a writer, it is a shift of perspective uh, um, on the work. Yeah. And, and yeah. when we've done this iteratively on nonfiction in particular, what we learn from people reacting to the different ideas and messages can then be reflected back into the, the structure of the book. And it yeah. might be, oh, that's now actually should be chapter seven. I hadn't thought about that. So there is a little bit of an iterative aspect to it, too. Yeah. Um, the other element that we talked about was where you have something that has equity, that has value. In this case, the third place, there's a significant number of people who know the term, who understand its merit and value. Um, that is an asset that you 
really need because that's the familiarity that's the link of what you're doing to an unknown so from a, a general reader standpoint the the primary title could be the third place the sequel or something like that uh -huh. that's an option okay um, all right so i really need to but i, I think you need a third place in yeah. in there somewhere yeah. for okay. either audience whether title or subtitle yeah yeah um, all you, right you, this you, is you why i came to came to you now because i <laughs> I needed don't lose that don't lose yeah that. okay um, I made a okay. big mistake on a project once where we actually had the potential to use a very famous uh actress who was very closely linked to the story and um I won't get into the detail but that ultimately was not used and that was a huge miss uh-huh um uh -huh. so it's okay uh, yes so this premise a... of author equity your brand equity equity meaning yeah real emotional psychological connection and value that people yeah. will generally yeah. pay for yeah um, so yeah. there's that element of it as well and then um the subtitle being the engine that creates the curiosity that creates the intrigue that makes you want to act the title is generally not going to do that the subtitle has to have that little sort of hook to it that makes you go tell me more I got a general idea where this is going, but I don't know the punchline. Right. And, but that's that's is surprising or isn't what quite what they thought. Yeah. It's something uh, yeah. that they don't have access to. Yeah. You know, it's the yeah. scientific secret or you know, whatever it happens to be. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna get the secret in yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> secret works uh yeah, more I'm often sure. Than I'm sure it's think. very effective. <laughs> oh well this and, is and then and yeah, then as yeah. far as you know screening it i think you know this the, the simple way the kind of hands-on way which could be very informative as well in terms of additional uh insight is to literally just put little placards together and um use that as your um stimulus to go into a third place where well, these people perfect. are and, and, and finding out what will make them act yeah yeah, and then you'd actually. rotate the order and then you want to have a control one. So, you know, this is the one that's, yeah. that we're going in with. It's, you know, it's the it's the safe bet that most people would expect to use. And the goal is, do you have something that significantly beats mm -hmm. that in terms mm -hmm. of action mm -hmm. or not? Mm -hmm. That'll be a fun project for me. And you do have order bias and not to get into the weeds on this, but generally yeah. the first thing people see is the one they react to most vividly. And as you get down into deeper in the rotation, um, people pay less attention. They're less uh -huh. likely to respond. Uh, so if you do have a winner, you know, make sure yeah. you, or you think is a winner, make sure it lives in different places. And if it's still uh -huh. going strong uh -huh. in the fifth uh -huh. rank in the order, then it's like, mm -hmm. oh, it's it's breaking out of um, all the clutter of these other titles mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. I've just been mm -hmm. sharing too. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that will give you some good um, good guidance. But again, yeah. the goal is what will make that person act. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you very much. I'll get Absolutely. back Pre to you with pleasure the report. As always. Okay, Karen. <laughs> good Thanks luck so with it. much. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye bye. Care. Bye.